Great, thanks all for coming. Um, I'm going to talk today about one of the major subdivisions of the animal kingdom, uh, the ecdysozoa. And the ecdysozoans, the molting animals, are one of the, the most important, perhaps, and certainly the most diverse. And you can appreciate just from this slide some of the disparity of body form that this group encompasses. So we've got simple worm-like things, the parasitic nematodes, little microscopic things that live between sand grains, all the way up to um, sort of yeah, rainforest-dwelling velvet worms, and yeah, the sort of familiar creepy crawlies and sh shellfish um, that we know so well. So the ectosozoa are a very diverse animal group, but where did this diversity come from? Presumably their common ancestor was some sort of simple worm-like organism. How do you get from a simple worm to all these disparate body plans that we see today? Well, to address this question, uh, well, there are various ways you might address the question, but one, the way I'm going to focus on today is by looking at the fossil record. And the fossil record allows us to ask all sorts of questions. So we can ask, what's the evolutionary history of each of the separate lineages within Ecdysozoa? How are these separate phyla, the separate body plans, related to each other in an evolutionary context? What did their ancestors look like? What sort of animals did these things evolve from? And the paleontological record, of course, is uniquely well placed to address the timing of this evolutionary radiation. Was this increase in diversity a sort of gradual process over many millions of years, as Darwin might have imagined? Or was it, as many people would suggest today, an explosive uh, burst of radiation, so that all this evolution compressed into a very short space of time? These questions apply throughout the animal kingdom, but the ectisozoans are a particularly good group to study um, early animal evolution in because they have a pretty good fossil record. They don't have the sort of mineralized shells and other elements that, of course, make up the bulk of the conventional fossil record. But they do have a robust cuticle that they uh, shed regularly. And this cuticle can preserve quite well in a range of settings, particularly in sites such as the Burgess Shale. Um, and so the Burgess Shale, which I'm, I'm sure many of you will know, this site of exceptional preservation in Canada, includes a range of ectisozoan taxa, ranging from very simple worm-like organisms through to things with legs and spines, up to things that are starting to look a little bit more complex, all the way up to fully-fledged members of modern animal phylum, or rather as a crown group, euarthropod. We've got an array, a, a range of diversities in here, and of course understanding evolution isn't as simple as just drawing a line from one to the other. But how we interpret these fossils and what, how, we, how they might make us think about animal evolution depends an awful lot on the framework that we use to actually understand and classify these organisms. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about how people have thought about classifying these often quite unusual organisms in the past and how our understanding has changed through time and how that's allowed us to, to fundamentally transform the way we think about the early evolution of all this disparity. So it's a little bit schematic, it's a bit cartoony, but the sort of Victorians had an expectation that basically each modern phylum, each modern body plan was essentially fixed in some way. That you know, If you take the modern phyla and go back in time, then they're not going to change particularly much. And so this diversity, maybe unexpected diversity of fossils in the Cambrian period, in the Victorian mindset, just represented new examples of the phyla that we already know. They weren't particularly interesting in an evolutionary sense, they were just new examples of existing boxes. But this framework started to, well, it holds up reasonably well in some cases. So the preapulids of the Burgess Shale, with things like Atoya, for example, are often attributed to the same phylum as modern preapulids, the sort of colloquially known penis worms for their rather unfortunate appearance. And they have some features in common. So Atoya has got this irversible mouth part. It can turn its throat inside out to eat, to move around. And modern preapulids can do the same. There's plenty in common. And to some extent, this relationship seems to hold up. Although actually, if I have time later, I'm going to maybe cast a little bit of doubt on that maybe slightly oversimplified um, statement. On the other hand, there are taxa that are much harder to fit into the modern phyla. So things like Hallucigenia and Opabinia, these things just look really weird. You know, Opabinia's got five eyes, this massive sort of flexible trunk with little pincers on the end. It's, it's bizarre, it's hard to interpret. It doesn't really look like it ought to belong in any of the modern groups. And so, um, so we can think about you know, this, these sort of weird fossils as they were appreciated, led to something of a, a new take on 
what we make of these early Cambrian fossils. It was clear that we couldn't just squeeze them into existing phyla, that we had to do something else. And so in the sort of the Stephen Jay Gould era, the idea was that each of these bizarre body plans actually represented a different phylum. Now, this, of course, has quite strong implications for what we think happened in the Cambrian. The Victorians saw all of the modern phyla appearing out of nowhere. They thought, whoa, something weird's going on. When you start to say we don't just have the existing modern phyla, but we have lots of extinct phyla as well, suddenly the Cambrian explosion looks so much bigger. We get loads of animal diversity, maybe more than we've ever seen since, and extinction winnows it down. This perspective makes the Cambrian explosion look really profound, really pronounced. So I'm going to take, it, take us through this sort of this mindset with hallucigenia and sort of take us on to how we might look at fossils in a different way that gives us, again, a different impression of these Cambrian fossils. So hallucigenia, most of you will probably know hallucigenia. Um, it's gone through a slightly checkered past of interpretation. So hallucigenia was first described by Walcott more than 100 years ago now, who very much had this mentality of fitting it into a modern animal phylum. And it doesn't look like anything much alive today, but the best Walcott would, could do was to compare it to an annelid worm. So annelids have got this central trunk, and on either side of their trunk are these little bristly things, uh, called, uh, called kiti on the end of parapodia. And um, yeah, here are the little legs, and they've got these little carbonaceous spines coming off. And so Walcott's idea was that hallucigenia was essentially an annelid, and these very long spines we see on one side of it were the kiti, just not many kiti, just a single pair coming off from one side. And these little nubs on the other side of the animal presumably represented a hidden or lost base of a second pair of kiti on the other side. So hallucigenia was sort of catalogued as an annelid worm shoved to the back of a drawer somewhere and forgotten about. Until, of course, the 1970s, when Simon Conway Morris came along and said, well, look, yeah, this doesn't really work. If we actually look at the fossils, the, the, this isn't the base of a spine. These are sort of long tentacular appendages on the other side. Uh, this doesn't work. This isn't a, just half a fossil. This is a more or less complete fossil. And we're seeing these, these paired appendages on one side and these single appendages on the other. And what's going on? And so, of course, Simon thought, well, this is an animal. It must have legs of some sort. Legs come in pairs. So the spines must be the legs. Hallucigenia must have had this sort of weird stilt-like gait somehow crawling around the seafloor in a, in a bizarre way. And presumably these tentacles on its back, what were they doing? They've got little claws on the end. Maybe they were grabbing food from the water and sending it along to the head. And, well, that sort of makes sense. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reliably informed. You yeah, know, a lot of people have come up and said to me, I told Simon he was wrong, but he published it anyway. And indeed, this, 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 is, this is not a, a particularly biologically familiar reconstruction. You know, this doesn't look like anything alive today. And this sort of bizarre, very imaginative reconstruction of hallucigenia is a large part of what triggered Stephen Jay Gould to come up with this idea of uh, a massive increase in uh, evolutionary opportunity in the Cambrian, the bizarre nature of the Cambrian. Uh, fauna. And I think actually yeah, this reconstruction, though it may have turned out to be wrong, has done a lot of good for Cambrian biology and getting people so excited about the weirdness of Cambrian organisms. Now, this, this interpretation, one of the things that led to it being uh, overturned, literally, was the discovery of the, the Changjiang biota, another rich source of fossil deposits in China, and a taxon in particular called Microdiction. So this is Microdiction reconstructed as a hallucigenia, and it looks a bit like hallucigenia, except where hallucigenia has spines, Microdiction has these armour plates. And these armour plates are clearly not appendages, they're not locomotory appendages. Hallucigenia wasn't, uh, sorry, Microdiction wasn't walking around on these plates. These seem to be dorsal armatures, so we can turn Microdiction upside down, and if we do, we can see that actually these tentacular appendages that were meant to be on the back seem to occur in pairs in some places. Here's a little hidden one at the back, there seems to be this forking. And so, um, so these actually, rather than being weird tentacle feeding apparatus things, are more likely to be legs we can reconstruct Microdiction. And so this, yeah, I think, is a, a lovely illustration of, of how you know, we can revise our, our hypotheses as a paleontologist and go back to fossils that have been known for, for many years and get a new take on them. So Lars Ramskold went back to the hallucigenia fossils in the Smithsonian and said, OK, let's use this microdictin paradigm to turn hallucigenia over and have a closer look at these tentacles. Uh, or could, could these be legs? And so the legs are on one side of the organism. Could there be another pair? hidden away somewhere. So Lars took out a dental drill and shipped away at, a, at the overlying matrix. And lo and behold, there behind, beneath the, the surface of the fossil was a, yeah, another, another leg going down. These, these tentacles were in pairs. Hallucigenia um, 
had had paired legs and was the opposite way up to what Simon had reinterpreted. So this led us to the sort of, I guess, the, the, the start of the modern interpretation of hallucinogenia, but even rotated and more or less correctly interpreted, this doesn't look like something you expect to find crawling around your back garden, right? It still looks very unusual. And the question is, does hallucinogenia still represent a separate body plan? Is it another example of an, a separate, now extinct phylum? And the more Cambrian deposits that were discovered, the more weight this <coughs> hypothesis seemed to bear. So there were things like Hallucigenia microdiction and lots of other genera as well of similar looking fossils that seem to have a similar body plan. And so perhaps we have this phylum Lobopodia. And I've said the word body plan a lot of times. How do we define a body plan? Well, we want to define some characteristics that unite all of the taxa in this particular body plan. And so with the lobopodians, we can point to a few features. Lobopodians uh, tend to be annulated. They've got surface ridges and they're also metameric, so they're not quite fully segmented, but they do have uh, limbs and this trunk armature often that repeat regularly somewhere on the way to being a segment. So we have these sort of serial units making up the organism. Uh, most lobopodians have got dorsal armour plates or maybe spines. And Lobopodians all have these lobopod limbs, which are hydrostatic appendages. They're just sort of fluid-filled filled cavities that end in a pair of claws. And so these features seem to define a lobopodium body plan. And we can say, OK, this defines phylum lobopodium. We can be happy with that. But of course, once this um, propo yeah, sort of proposal for a body plan came up, people said, well, hang on, this rings a bell. I know, I know other things that have got some of these features. What, what, about, what about these guys? These are velvet worms. These are rainforest-dwelling uh, living organisms that look a lot like lobopodians, actually. They, have, they seem to have a little bit in common. Are these living lobopodians? Does the phylum onychophora actually represent a modification of the lobopodian body plan. And so sure enough, you know, here are some, some onychophorans, and uh, these are annulated. You can see these sort of rows of rings along the body. They're metameric. They've got repeated legs matched by repeated internal organs inside. Um, they have dorsal, well, oh, no, hang on a moment. They don't actually have dorsal armature, which is another of these lobopodian features, but there are some naked lobopodians that don't have this, so maybe that's not too important. And onychophorans, velvet worms, have got these lobopod legs with a pair of claws on the end as well. So most of these features of the lobopodian body plan we do indeed see in the velvet worms. So does that mean that velvet worms are lobopodians? Are they in fact the same phylum as these things like hallucinogenia? Well, often, often, often people would, yeah, would, would leave it there and say, OK, that's it, they're all the same. But I, I think actually the velvet worm body plan is more than these very simple things. If you look at all living velvet worms, all members of the crown group, there are a lot of features that all of the living velvet worms have that we don't see in Lobopodians. So, for example, this is, a, this is the, the head of a, a velvet worm, and you can see it's, it's licking its lips. Well, it's not. It's got this pair of claws, which are actually modified limbs inside the head that come out and, and pince things. They use them to, to pierce their arthropods prey. And these are very distinctive in, in, in their appearance. They're sort of serrated. They're nasty. They're only found in velvet worms. They're shed through all velvet worms. So I think, you know, these jaw elements are part of the velvet worm body plan. What else? It looks like this, this animal's got a pair of eyes on either side of its mouth. These aren't eyes, actually, but these are, uh, these are slime glands. So velvet worms, they're only the size of my finger. But they can squirt this adhesive glue up to 30 centimetres with which to capture any poor, unfortunate passing insects um, and give their jaws some exercise. So they're yeah, marvellous things. These are, again, all living velvet worms have them. I think these slime glands are part of the velvet worm body plan. And here, let's, let's say something else about this. Squirting slime's great if you live on land. It doesn't go down so well if you're a marine organism. If you're underwater, you know, the, the physics are a little bit different. So this is something that's clearly in the velvet worm body plan and not in any of the lobopodians because these are marine organisms. Velvet worms do have eyes, however. They've got this little paired, simple ocelli. Um, but they also, they're, they're covered in all these little dimples and pustules. And this is what gives them their name. Their velvety texture um, is created by this very complex skin ornamentation and the main function or a main function of this is to allow them to retain water so it's sort of a water repellent barrier that covers their skin which is again something that you might think is useful when you're terrestrial not particularly useful if you're marine so these are a few items and there are other features of the you know, the unite all modern onychophorans, I won't go on all day, but this is just to make the point that actually, when, when it comes down to it, there are lots of features in the velvet worm body plan that aren't there in the lobopodian 
body plan. And in fact, well, let, what, what do these guys have in common? It doesn't come down to an awful, awful lot. We've got annulation, we've got metamerism, but hey, all sorts of things are annulated. All sorts of things have got repeated body units. You know, is, is this really particularly significant? Um, they've got hydrostatic legs with claws on the end. Well, you know, the echinoderms have got sort of hydrostatic leg-like things. Claws, you know, they come all over the place. Cats have got claws. You know, are these really meaningful similarities? Or you know, is there any real definitive evidence to unite onychophorans and labopodians? They could be completely separate phyla, then their few similarities have appeared convergently. So how do we get at sort of, you know, true relationship? And you know, the analogy I, I'd like to use here is, is you know, if you look at an aeroplane, this, yeah, this, this could be a Boeing aeroplane or it could be an Airbus aeroplane. These are two very different categories of aeroplane, but aeroplanes by, made by these two firms look very similar because if you look very different from this, you don't fly very well. And so there are functional constraints that lead biological organisms or human machines to take a certain appearance, but that large-scale appearance doesn't tell us about much about how they were made, as it were. If we want to know who made this aeroplane, we want, we want to look at details that don't really affect the function. So you maybe Boeing use a particular type of rivet in their factories. And by looking at these small constructional details of how things are put together, you can find clues that do truly represent affinity. So with this in mind, we went and we looked at hallucigenia and we said, okay, well, hallucigenia has got these features. It looks a tiny bit like a velvet worm, but can we actually see any constructional detail that gives us a stronger signal. And one of the things we found, we put some hallucigenia fossils in an electron microscope, and the claws actually had this very interesting uh, appearance that hadn't really been described in detail before. And so the, this is a hallucigenia claw, and if you look very carefully, you can just about see it's made of a, 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 an outer claw, an inner claw, and a claw within that. We've got a cone in cone construction. It's like a series of nested gloves. And this is very peculiar. And this, hadn't, you know, this, this wasn't something that was widely known. And we thought, well, what's going on here? Is there anything alive today that has this similar construction? And it turns out there is. So I had some velvet worms kicking around in test tubes. I thought, right, OK, velvet worm claws. Let's have a look. So I got a velvet worm claw. And happily enough, you can see exactly the same construction, a cone within a cone within a cone. And here I've just actually slightly just teased apart these little cones to show these are actually a, a nested stack of structures. You can see a little air bubble in between where they've, they've moved apart. And there's a biological significance to this. This is of fundamentally related to how velvet worms grow. So all ectisozoans are molting animals. And if you're going to molt, you have a short period where you've just shed your tough outer skin and you've got a new soft skin that you have to very quickly toughen up. Well, if, you've, if your claws are very soft, they're not very useful. And so, presume, so velvet worms have found this clever solution to, um, to molting. So when they molt, the outer element of this stack of claws comes peeling off, and it reveals a preformed claw inside that's all ready to go. So they can molt their skin, and they can be scuttling around and using their jaws immediately without having to wait under a rock somewhere for their, their, their claws to toughen up. So this is a constructional detail that reflects how velvet worms grow, and uh, arguably therefore represents a, a strong evolutional, evolutionary signal. And it's only found in velvet worms. We looked in tardigrades, we looked in arthropods, we looked wherever we could think, and we don't see this construction anywhere else at all. So these claws do seem to suggest that hallucigenia has an onychophoran affinity. And we can go a little bit further. This is, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but this is the result of a phylogenetic analysis, looking at as much morphological data as we could gather from various Cambrian lobopodians as well as modern taxa. And there's a very strong signal that hallucigenia does plot out with the velvet worm. So this gives us a new way to think about lobopodians, about velvet worms. Um, rather than thinking of them as different phyla, we can recognise the fact that all life shares a common ancestor. And so we can take a phylogenetic perspective and use this evidence from hallucigenia to unravel somehow the origin of the velvet worm body plan, and if there is one, the hallucigenia uh, body plan. So here's a sort of very schematic uh, phylogenetic tree, and just to sort of, yeah, just to illustrate the general principles, we can say, okay, here, here's the crown group, the modern living velvet worms, and they have a deep uh, lineage, and hallucigenia basically represents an early evolutionary offshoot from the lineage that led to the modern velvet worm. This means that features that are unique to the velvet worms, these things I was arguing should be part of the velvet worm body plan, evolved after hallucigenia diverged from the main lineage. 
Hallucigenia, of course, has features of its own. So things like these dorsal spines that typify hallucigenia and indeed other hallucigenia. So here are some close relatives and you can see again these strong dorsal spines, this, these very weird morphologies in these um, lobopodians described in the last couple of years. So we can define a hallucigenia clade as well, but all importantly, this shared feature, this cone-in-cone -cone construction of the claws, dates back to before the common ancestor of velvet worms and hallucigenia. So this represents, I think, something of a paradigm shift. And yeah, I'm not saying this is the first study to suggest this, but it makes the point really clearly, I think, that body plans are not fixed entities that appear overnight in the Cambrian explosion, but they're things that evolve gradually. And hallucigenia helps us to actually give a really nice story of part of the, the, the onycophylum body plan appearing deeper in time and other parts evolving later. It's an incremental, gradual approach. Darwin would have been happy, I think, uh, with, this, with this outcome. And further fossil data hopefully will give us details of this stretch of the tree up here and allow us to break down further these other features of the onycophron body plan to show that this uh, suite of features that characterises all modern taxa accumulated gradually and it looks rapid because the intermediate forms have gone extinct. So this, 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 this creates a bit of a problem for the sort of typical body plan approach. Yeah, we, can, we can't just say, okay, let's split things up into more body plans. Let's have an onycophron body plan, a hallucigenia body plan, because each time you find a new fossil that fits somewhere slightly different on the tree, you end up having a new body plan. This isn't a particularly sensible way to go about it. But you might, you might come back and say, okay, well, we've, we've found out that these things are related. Why don't we lump them together? Why don't we resurrect this idea that onycophrons belong to lobopodia? And of course, the problem with this is that lobopodians are not only stem group onycophorans. Hallucigenia is, but other lobopodians have got different affinities according to our phylogenetic analysis and other morphological features. So some lobopodians, yes, are on the stem group to onycophora, but other lobopodians, such as Aceaea, for example, seem to be on the stem lineage of the tardigrades. So these are now today microscopic organisms, you know, less than a millimetre long. Um, but, and it's, it's been suggested, actually, that this microscopic body size is ancestral for maybe all of animals. But no, these organisms evolved from lobopodian-like organisms. They were primitively large. They shrunk through time. Other lobopodians, still further, are found on the stem group to the arthropods. So we have this lobopodian concept, and it actually includes ancestors of three living phyla today. So... so the Lobopodians aren't a destination. It's not that there's this additional body plan. They're almost a transitional body plan. That's a word I use a little bit cautiously. But we've sort of moved away from this idea of things fitting in boxes or the extinct things fitting in between <coughs> modern phyla. Once we can see that things have a common ancestor, once we take this phylogenetic history into account, it's actually not at all surprising that there are regions of the tree that look very different from things that are alive today. And these regions of the tree... Yeah, we are, are worthy, I think, of having their own body plan. I think that is a meaningful thing to say. And, of course, it's very difficult to provide an objective definition. When does something stop being a lobopodian and start being an onycophoran? But I think it is true that there's a, a morphological suite that's extinct, but that has, contains the roots of these modern phyla today. So hopefully you agree hallucigenia has helped us to understand how body plans have, have come to be, how the onycophoran body plan has arisen, in a more gradual process through the Cambrian period. So in the second half of the talk, I want to take things a little bit deeper. And hallucigenia, surprisingly, has implications not just for the panarthropod phyla, so that's uh, arthropods, tardigrades, and onycophorans, but for ecdysozoa as a whole, moving deeper into these worm-like taxa. So I want to flash up, this is a, a topology of, of panarthropods that's supported by our morphological data. And I'm just going to explore this tree a little bit, looking for data from, from the fossil record to help see whether we can constrain what the ancestor of ecdysozoa as a whole uh, might have looked like and how we might use that to say something meaningful about evolution during the Cambrian period and maybe even the rate of the Cambrian explosion itself. Oops, so we've already met the arthropods, the tardigrades, the velvet worms, and just to remind you that there are also these other ectisozoans, these worm-like things, and I've, I've deliberately not given much resolution here because there's a lot of discussion as to whether these are a clade, whether they're paraphyletic to the other, uh, to, to the panarthropods, but there are these worm-like things that are a sister group to, to the panarthropod phyla. <coughs> 
and I want to walk through some observations from fossil tanks. So starting up in the stem lineage of the Euarthropoda with, with Herdia. So Herdia, it's a relative of Anomalocaris, which you might have heard of, and these organisms have got a very weird mouth that's very hard to get your head around. This is the mouth of a Herdia uh, organism. And you can see it's got this bizarre construction. It's got this sort of outer circle that looks a bit like a pineapple ring, these sort of plate-like segments around the edge of the mouth opening. And within this pineapple ring are these really fearsome, ferocious-looking uh, yeah, denticulate teeth. They actually sit within the throat of the organism itself. And the way this would have worked as a biological entity is these plates would have formed probably a sort of suction cup, would have sucked in food, and the teeth would have grabbed stuff and shepherded it gently towards the digestive tract. So this is a sort of schematic diagram of the Herdia mouth part, and I'm just drawing attention to these two main components, the round the mouth plates and the down the throat teeth. This is distinctive to Herdia and Anomalocaridids. It looks really weird. It could, could, could this be just another example of a bizarre um, Cambrian body plan that's now extinct? Well, actually, you know, people said, well, look, this isn't actually unique. I've seen something similar before, and there's something similar to be seen in the tardigrades, so these microscopic um, the organisms. This is a tardigrade mouth. It's the best picture I could find, and you can see the reason it's the best picture I can find is this is a one micron scale bar. These are really tiny things. They're really hard to work with. Um, but this is the mouth, and you can see around the mouth, there's this ring of plate-like lamellae around the mouth itself. And maybe you can just see, is the projector good enough? There's this little stippled appearance down the throat. And these are nanometer scale objects, but these are little needle-like teeth within the throat of the tardigrade. So a tardigrade mouth, sort of schematically, has got, again, this similar construction of round the mouth plates and down the throat teeth, even if they're really teeny. So we've got two occurrences of a, a very similar appearing uh, configuration. <coughs> Do these represent independent origins or are these actually inherited from a common ancestor of arthropods and tardigrades? And if they are, that would be quite exciting. Molecular work, on the whole, doesn't place tardigrades next to, next to arthropods. It places them with nematodes or closer to onychophorans. There are various configurations, but this is not a particular common topology on molecular results, which are somewhat unsettled on the position of tardigrades. But there is a reasonable amount of morphological evidence, looking at the way that the nerve tissue is arranged, looking at the musculature, the limbs, that does seem to hint that tardigrades and arthropods are closely related. So wouldn't it be exciting, actually, if we had this shared configuration of the mouth parts as a further morphological line of evidence to link these two groups together? Well, in order to actually make a strong case that these were present in the common ancestor of these two groups, it would be nice to actually fill in the details. Can we find anything that's in between tardigrades and herdia phylogenetically that also has a comparable mouse part? And there are lobopodians, as I mentioned earlier, in the stem group of the arthropods. And here's an example. This is Jean Chanopodia. And this is a, it's not the most attractive reconstruction, and that reflects the fact that the fossils are few and not particularly um, easy to work with. Um, but here, here's, here's the, the mouth area here at the front of the throat, and let's zoom in on a, a, a lovely picture of, of the fossil foregut. And, well, you can see, you've got to look a little bit carefully, but when you know what you're looking for, can you see along the throat, there's all these tooth plates with little denticulate margins along the edge. And around the edge of the mouth, you can just see these four or five little long lamellae. So these are circumoral features. If you could reconstruct the full three-dimensional view down the throat, you'd see the same construction that we've, we've been talking about. It's around the mouth plates and these down the throat teeth. It seems to be pretty well uh, supported and it's, it's, it's been found in other lobopodians in a similar place on the phylogenetic tree. Um, this seems to join the dots. This seems to show us that these organisms together inherited this mouth part configuration from a common ancestor. Why has no one noticed this before? Well, part of the reason no one's noticed this before is we don't seem to see this configuration in living euarthropods. And that seems a little bit strange and a little bit worrying. Um, yeah, we sh surely we would have noticed this. Well, I think part of the reason we haven't noticed this is people don't spend a lot of time actually doing really detailed morphological work on the inner lining of arthropod 
for guts, who, who knows why. Um, but there you go, there's, there's not a, a huge amount of literature on it, but the literature there is actually shows, here's, here's a, the cockroach foregut, and you can see these plate-like elements with little teeth along the foregut. So there's actually, there's nothing around the mouth, these circumoral plates don't exist in any arthropod I've been able to find, but these throat teeth actually are widespread throughout the arthropods. And this suggests we can sort of fill in our tree a little bit further, that, okay, there was an evolutionary loss somewhere close to the base of the arthropod crown group, but these foregut teeth have been retained from this common ancestor. So this is making me quite happy. Great, okay, we've got this, this lovely feature uniting arthropods and tardigrades. But of course the next question is, well, does it occur anywhere else? Where else might it occur in the tree? What about, what about the onychophorans? So let, let's look at the onychophoran um, mouth arrangement. Well, here's an onychophoran mouth. And lo and behold, hooray, we've got these, these plate-like elements around the mouth, right? There's this little sort of rickidian teeth along the throat. Oh, we found this same construction in onychophorans, right? Wrong. Actually, this is where, again, we have to understand homology. This looks like a mouth, and if you're talking in English, it is a mouth. But if you're talking in careful sort of scientific terminology and looking to reflect homology, this isn't actually the... Uh, the mouth of the organism. What's happened, and you can look at onychophoran development, you can watch it happen, the cheeks, the sides of the face essentially, have grown out of the onychophoran and grown forwards and rounds and encompassed the, the real mouth of the organism in this cavity of sort of weird deformed cheeks that have come round and fused together. So we've created a buccal cavity that's actually in front of the mouth. Onychophorans have got an internal mouth. That sounds like a weird thing to say, but it's important to get at these homologies and to know we're talking about the same thing. And in fact, we can see this isn't a radial ring of elements. This is a bilaterally symmetrical arrangement of the lip papillae. So these are not equivalent to what we've been looking at in the other taxa. And if we actually look at an onychophoran mouth, so here's the, the sort of lip region, but the mouth itself is inside the head. There's no circumoral features. There's no teeth within the throat, actually. Onychophorans have got a completely naked foregut. So, you know, great, we've, you know, even more evidence that we've, we've got something unique to tardigrades and arthropods, right? Well, let's be thorough, let's, you know, go and look at other things. What about preapolids? What about these sort of other uh, ectisozoan organisms? Well, okay, preapolids, here's a, a preapolid from the Burgess shell. This is Otoya, and it exempt, it's a really nice example of preapolid arrangement. And preapolids are really helpful to this sort of study, because if you want to look at an arthropod gut, you've got to cut it open and dissect it. But here, preapolids, of course, turn their throat inside out. And so all this, this lovely throat is just completely on display for any paleontologist who happens to be walking by. And so we can zoom in and we can have a look at the arrangement of the, uh, the preapolid throat and the foregut you can see is lined with all these tiny tiny teeth i could talk for ages about these teeth they're fantastic they've got so much detail preserved but here they are on the foregut and consistently whichever preapulid you look at living or extinct you can see this ring of spines a single ring of spines surrounding the mouth opening itself and sometimes there are other hooks, hooks along the trunk but we can see these two components if we imagine what the mouth would have looked like if the throat was turned inwards we'd have a very similar arrangement this ring of structures around the mouth, these teeth lining the throat. So actually, ah, the story's looking a bit different now, isn't it? We've seen this same construction now in preapulates. Could it be that this isn't a feature uniting tardigrades <laughs> and arthropods, but this is a feature that goes all the way back to the common ancestor of all ecdysozoa, this one of the three major subdivisions of the animal kingdom. Could this be inherited from all the way back? Well, to work this out, we need to do something similar to what we did with the Janshanapodia early. We need to find something that can help us to constrain the ancestral state in onychophorans. If onychophorans never had these features, then perhaps we've got two independent origins. The preapolid mouth look a bit different to everything else. But if onychophorans ancestrally had this arrangement and lost it secondarily, that would be really strong evidence that this complex arrangement was present in the ancestor of all ectisozoans. If only we had a stem group on the cofferin, we could look at it. Well, OK, we do, of course. We have hallucigenia, which fits in this very important phylogenetic position. So it should be a simple job, shouldn't it? All we need to do is to look at hallucigenia's head, see whether it had these round-the-mouth plates, down-the-throat spines, job done. OK, sounds easy. The first problem we had to solve, though, was finding hallucigenia's head. It sounds like quite a simple thing, but here's a set of reconstructions from, from 2015. Uh, and you can see these, these look very different. The hedge regions look quite bizarre. Sometimes you've got this big bulge on one end, sometimes you've got a little pointy tail. It's not, the ends of hallucigenia are not particularly well defined. 
And part of the reason here is taphonomic. So this is, a, this is a hallucigenia fossil that seems to show this big bulbous head on one side of the body and this long hockey stick-like tail on the other end of the body. And there have been questions for a long time in the literature saying, well, is this blob actually part of the organism? Is it really the head? The, other, the alternative hypothesis is it actually decay fluids. So as the innards of hallucigenia decayed, as the, the organism had been buried and eventually got squashed, all of this was sort of rotting goo, got squirted out of a small <coughs> hole at one end of the organism and left this large balloon-like structure that looks a bit like a head. How do you test that? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at the composition of the fossil itself. And what we did actually is to look at the, this, the same fossil under a different type of lighting. So this is, um, this is a, fossil, a picture taken under polarised light. And it basically, the, the areas that are black are dark because they're reflective films of carbon. So you have light that's vibrating in one direction and it bounces off the carbon film and it's still vibrating in the same direction. You've got a polarizer film at right angles and poof, the light hits it, it's black. Okay, so if you've got a reflective carbon feature that's reflecting the original carbon of the organism, it turns out black. Um, otherwise it doesn't, uh, it, it turns out brighter. But if you take out the polarizer, you see again the composition affects the way the light behaves again. And so this is a photograph under non-polarised light and you can see actually well what's happened look the head has completely disappeared this blob is no longer visible under plain polarised light which shows it has a different composition to the rest of the body this wasn't part of the organism at all in fact we can see this nice little paired legs terminating the body which is quite a useful character phylogenetically um, this is the tail end of the organism and not the head at all the hallucinogenia wasn't only upside down but back to front so now we know where the head is, we can pop it in an SEM and we can take a closer look. And the first thing we see, even just from photographs actually, is this interesting phenomenon. You can see the foregut quite nicely preserved running along the axis of the, the, the head. But the foregut ends just slightly before the end of the organism. So maybe we've got another feature here of the onychophoran body plan. Yeah, Hallucigenia's cheeks during development presumably also grew out to create this buccal cavity in front of the mouth opening itself. So the mouth opening slightly set back from the end of the head. We can reconstruct this, we can zoom in in a bit more detail, um, and here's, here's an SEM image showing it's a little bit hard to see what's going on. This is, this is on the way to the rest of the body, and this is coming out to the head. It's buried by a bit of slab. But you can see quite clearly this sort of little runway of black flecks running along the, the, the axis of the organism. And these seem to be teeth that are preserved within the throat, and these are consistently seen in the same location in a number of specimens. There are teeth running along the foregut, they run all the way up to the first pair of spines, and then they disappear as you move into the next section of the gut. So hallucigenia had teeth in its foregut. Here's another specimen showing the outline of the body. We can zoom in a little bit and we can see again this runway of teeth down the throat. Uh, actually, the eye is preserved really nicely. The visual pigments seem to be preserved. And can you just see there's just this little hint of a grin, isn't there? Just the hallucinogenia smiling back, this semicircle towards, not quite at the front of the body, but just at the edge, at, at the end of the mouth, in, within this mouth cavity. It's a little bit faint in that specimen, but there are other specimens that show it uh, even better. Here's another specimen. Here's that foregut run of teeth, and here's the mouth. We can zoom in, and actually this little smile we can see is constructed of, it looks like lots of little plates, little laminae running around. Okay? Um, so we seem to have this configuration where we've got a ring of plates around the mouth within the buccal cavity, and it's actually a single row of teeth along the top of the throat rather than surrounding the throat, as, as in other taxa. Um, but it seems to be the same configuration we've been talking about. And just to try to convince you that I'm really seeing something and these aren't just flecks in a convenient place, um, this is another hallucigenia little oral cone thing. I just want to show it side by side with a herdia mouth part. So this is, herdia, remember, it looked like that pineapple ring earlier, but this is a lateral view of herdia. And you can see actually the, the similarities sort of there in, in the overall shape, this sort of orb-like thing with the stripes running parallel to it. So I think there's pretty good evidence that these are functionally and, uh, and biologically equivalent features, even though the hallucigenia one is several orders of magnitude smaller. So we have this oral cone in hallucigenia. We've filled this gap on our phylogenetic tree. Hallucigenia had this same configuration we've now seen in stem group arthropods, in tardigrades, in preapulids. It occurs throughout ectisozoa, and the only parsimonious uh, account for this is that this was present in the ancestor of all ectisozoans. So this is quite exciting. We can use a phylogenetic analysis to pick out another few features that were probably present, and we can reconstruct what the ancestor of all ectisozoa looked like. So it was probably annulated. 
Uh, probably not metamaric, but it had this ring of plates around its mouth. It had this foregut lined with teeth. And probably uh, various lines of evidence show us that the, this foregut could probably turn itself inside out. So this is actually a more complicated reconstruction of the ancestral ectisozoan than I flashed up as being what you might expect at the start of the lecture. It's not just a simple tube. It's actually got a bit of complexity going on. Now, <coughs> we, we've also been able to use hallucigenia to reconstruct the ancestor of the panarthropods, which had these uh, plates running along the back, these paired appendages, this metamerism. Uh, so we've got a, a good vision of the ancestral panarthropod. And actually, our, our analyses, they're only provisional at this point, but seem to show that there's this intermediate stage where we've got taxa with plates but no legs. And, well, if you know your Cambrian fossils, this might remind you of uh, paleoscalicid worms, which have got... Uh, Lobopodian-like plates, they've got an irreversible proboscis. They seem to sort of form an intermediate in between these two. And, um, well, more on that. Um, and we can say so we've got these, these separate body plans that we can sort of fit into a phylogenetic framework. So Lobopodia, this Lobopodian body plan, <coughs> seems to correspond to this paraphyletic group ancestral to arthropods tardigrades on ecophorans. Paleoscalicids, this you know, separate body plan, they, they've often been grouped in with the preapulids, but I think um, that there's, be there's better evidence that these actually represent a paraphyletic group again. So on the, some paleoscalicids went on to evolve into nematodes, other paleoscalicids went on to evolve into lobopodians. And the Cambrian preapulids actually are not all members of the modern preapulid crown group. But uh, again, these are very preliminary results, but they're indicating that some of these so-called preapulids actually represent a paraphyletic grade that encompasses some stem group preapulids, but some stem group members of this larger group containing these four other phyla. So this gives us a different way to see body plans. These aren't separate destinations, but some of these are transitional forms. And I just want to close up by saying, OK, well, why do we care? We've reconstructed some ancestral morphologies here. Academically, this all seems very interesting, but does it have any deeper conclusions for how we think about the pace of evolution and the origin of diversity? So <clears throat> what I'm flashing up here is a little bit schematic, but I think it's, it's, it's reasonably fair to do this. Um, what we've done is we've reconstructed the ancestral ectisozoan and is looking something a little bit like a toilet. It's annulated, it's got these reversible mouth parts. It has this sort of you know, general muscular construction. It's a bit like a living preapulid. Well, things with a similar morphology today, such as the preapulids, um, create burrows that look a lot, a lot like the same burrows that mark that, that, yeah, this, this is uh, T. pedum, which is the ichno species used to mark the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. And burrows like this are produced by organisms that have a, a morphology very similar to the morphology that we're reconstructing for the ancestral ectisozoan. So, okay, throw in your caveats now about the incompleteness of the fossil records, but could this first occurrence at the base of the Cambrian period of trace fossils produced by an ancestral ectisozoan actually give us a date for the origin of the ectisozoan phylum? This is one line of evidence, you could maybe argue about it, but there's another line of evidence that, that points to a similar conclusion. So this is one of these four gut teeth that um, has actually been extracted from an acid maceration of some siltstones, but we can identify it by comparing the detailed morphology of teeth on the four guts of Berger shale preapulids down to the genus level. This tooth is assignable to a genus of preapulid-like organisms called Selkirchia. And so we can identify these fossils taxonomically very precisely. And here's another fossil. It's not quite as well preserved, but morphologically, I think you, you know, most of you hopefully will agree there's a very close morphological resemblance here. And this fossil here has been interpreted as coming from Ediacaran strata. And OK, the stratigraphy is not particularly well constrained. I think it's probably more likely this is early Cambrian. But we've got a separate line of evidence. We've got teeth here of the nature that we've reconstructed as being present in the ancestral ectisozoan, we're finding them in the lowest Cambrian strata, we aren't finding them in the Ediacaran strata. We've got trace fossils constructed by this ancestral ectisozoan, we're finding them in the Cambrian, we're not finding them in the Ediacaran. I think we've got very strong evidence here um, that we can use to constrain the origin of the ectisozoan crown group. And, well, more fossils are certainly needed to improve the resolution, to reduce the error bars on these first occurrences. But I think it's very difficult, actually, to, recon to reconcile the onset of these two fossilization modes 
in the Cambrian with a deep origin, which some molecular clocks would suggest, you know, way down 700 million years ago. Some, some clocks are saying it dies as it should evolve. So I think we've got a way here of sanity testing um, predictions of the molecular clock. So just to sort of flash this on schematically, so we've got this origin of ectoisozoa, which the fossil evidence at the moment, and I'm willing for this number to change as new fossils turn up, but at the moment we can date this to 542 million years ago. And we can use these same modes of fossilization to date further nodes within this tree. So the panarthropod node, maybe we can associate with certain things. Oh, well, sorry, we could be a bit further up. So uh, on the Cofferans, we've got hallucigenia-like spines from this small carbonaceous fossil preservation dating to um, just, be just before the Abdebanian. So 522 million years ago, we've got spines that we can convincingly attribute to stem group on Ecofrance. And around about the same time we're seeing Rusophycus, we're seeing trace fossils we can attribute maybe to Tactopoda, maybe to Panarthropoda. So we've got other lines of evidence that allow us to date this node at around about 520 million years ago. And, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, you keep on using the word caveat, you know, these dates are not set, well, they are sort of set in stone, but they're, they're not, yeah, they're not, not going to change. But we've got some sort of guide here, a preliminary guide to how long this radiation took. Do you see, we've got a date here, let's take it that it's true, of 540-ish million years ago, we've got a date here for 520 million years ago. The Cambrian explosion in Ecdysozoa lasted, according to this, 20 million years. We can put a time on it. We can actually say what we mean and we can put a, a, a precise time on it that will only become more precise as the fossil record improves. So 20 million years, that, that's quite an interesting number, actually. We've got a lot of diversification. I said how much diversity there is in ectisozoans today. But this happened over a span of 20 million years. And I think it's, it's interesting to compare this. Yeah, I, I wish I knew more about vertebrates, but... If you look at the radiation of mammals sort of through the P uh, PETM, you've got maybe a five million year period of, of radiation, would that be fair? In which you see the origin of bats, you see the origin of whales, things like giraffes. You get this huge array of mammal body plants in five million years at the PETM. We've got 20 million years here to get a radiation of body plants in the, in the ectisozoa. I don't know how you compare the magnitude of those radiations, but it seems to me that they're on the same sort of order. Yeah, the Cambrian explosion doesn't seem to be quite as different as you might have thought from other radiations that have occurred throughout evolutionary history. So this is, yeah, this is a, a question to leave you thinking about. Is there anything special about the Cambrian explosion? Is it just another evolutionary radiation of the same magnitude, the same rate as any other major evolutionary ra radiation in the Phanerozoic, and it just looks special because it's the first one? Okay, let me go there.